What's going on everyone? Venom Mystere back with another strategy centric video. It's not going to be a cast of a pro game. This is going to be one of those videos where I look at a replay and then sort of dissect the game and discuss it and very frequently break it down for the beginner. So this is actually going to start off in a 2v2. The very end of a 2v2 game I played with the random against a couple randoms. And basically this is just going to contextualize the replays that we're going to be learning from and examining. So this guy, the red guy, Joker, is sort of the antagonist of this because his ally has already been defeated and the DTs are ravaging his base. Now Joker is not a happy camper and he likes to talk. So it looks like he's not going to be able to kill these DTs. His scan was a little bit sloppily placed. His third gets pushed back, but really, we're just here to examine what Joker says. Because like many people in 2v2, anytime he loses, Joker says, oh, it was my teammate. And you know, I understand having bad allies, but Joker is one of those guys who every single game, no matter what happens, oh, it's my teammate, it's my teammate, it's my teammate. And it's funny because StarCraft, known primarily for being a 1v1 game, is sort of the game where people can't really do that. But in 2v2, a lot of times these teammate blamers are willing to 1v1 to show their own skill. And I can respect this, and if they like to flame before they type out and cry baby, a lot of times I'll take them up on the offer. So Joker here, he's in a position where he made his natural a PF because it's Shrines of Linzul, this tiny ass rush map. I'm not saying that's good, but it's just the way that it is. And this space is floating because of DTs. It's very very hard pressed for scans, that was his last one, kills the DTs, but he's going to lose his army here. And in the replays coming up we're going to be talking about essentially what different maps mean. And here he says, lucky cunts, fucking BS, and I respond lol, because it's hilarious. So obviously this had nothing to do with luck, the game was over 10 minutes ago, 1v1 me bitch. There it is. So I immediately PM him and say, let me host. So back when I first started playing StarCraft 2, I had no idea really what the difference between the maps were. <coughs> My buddy Riley and I used to just play on the map Agria Valley over and over. Riley was the first guy that I played StarCraft with. We bought the game together and sort of we're both awful and bronze at the same time and we're trying to learn together and we would just play Agria Valley because it was the first map on the list so I had no idea what when, what made a map a rush map what made a map good for Zerg, bad for Zerg, good for Protoss, I didn't know anything so in these two replays of me 1v1ing Joker we're going to take a look at basically the features of maps and what makes them play a certain way and what you should look for. Now because Protoss and Terran are both pretty similar, they build workers constantly and have production facilities, a lot of what I say will be related to Zerg because Zerg is sort of different from the other two races and very frequently it's whether a map is good or bad for Zerg is different from good or bad for Terran and Protoss because Really, the main thing about Zerg that you need to know is you want to be making drones pretty much all the time until you have to make attacking units. And after you see a push, then you make your attacking units. And you just want to squeeze out as many drones as possible with Zerg, so it's different than the other races, which can make attacking units and workers at the same time without losing worker capability. I know that was long-winded, but it had to be said. So this is Steps of War. This was a very this is a, this is a very famous map, widely considered the biggest rush map in StarCraft II history. This map was used professionally from the beginning of the beta all the way into like I think uh, season three of the GSL. So it got used for probably like eight months, which is a ton because this map is very small. So right out the gate, let's talk about this little trick where if you want to know how small a map is if you look on the mini map and just look at how big the mineral patches are that's sort of just like a really quick way to tell just how vast it is now of course the main thing you really want to judge rush distance on is natural to rush to natural natural to natural so I'm just gonna this is about one screen 
between the natural, you can literally see both the ramps on one screen. So that's extremely small, because one screen obviously is pretty much nothing. So on this map, Steps of War, we can see the minerals, if we just look right here on the mini-map, the minerals appear massive. So that's how you know it's a pretty dang small map. So let's talk about in general how you play small maps. You do not early expand. Now I know a lot of people are going to be saying Savage Wood, like Venom Mysteria, everyone knows this. This is very simple. I'm going to address the beginners first because this is sort of targeted towards them because it was very it was a very long process learning the ins and outs of what made a map good because I could never find a video of someone explicitly stating what you should be looking for with new maps. It sort of took me years and years to just puzzle it out. So rush distance is the very most important thing I would say about maps. You measure rush distance from natural to natural, as I said, and you can tell how small a map is by looking at the size of the minerals on the mini-map. Now, how do you play rush favored maps, small maps? Well, you don't early expand because rushing is sort of the opposite of expanding, and you never want to do this. You never want to get supply blocked. This can happen if you're used to doing fast expansion builds, you're used to having a CC supply kick in, because once the CC finishes you get more supply. And scouting is denied there. That's just something you have to mentally account for whenever you switch from, you know, normal two base styles to aggressive one base plays like this. We can see that Joker here is transferring workers, he's elected to get a fast expansion up. And he has a huge worker lead. So what this means is that if I do this big push off of one base, and he has two bases, and has had two bases, and is actively making workers two at a time, then I will be behind. If I'm only mining off of one base, and he has two, because I committed everything to one big push, that's sort of the trade-off. You know the expression combat triangle, a common example would be runescape, where magic's good against melee, range is good against magic and melee is good against range. Well, very similarly in StarCraft II, safe play beats aggressive play, greedy play beats safe play, you get the picture. So this is an aggressive play, and this is a greedy play. Aggressive beats greedy because greed means that you favor a really big economy, you sacrifice units, maybe you get a lot of tech, maybe you get upgrades, so that means that in this situation, my one base push is going to be good against his fast expansion because he sacrificed, and I'm going to pause right here, he sacrificed getting a lot of unit producing facilities up in favor of getting upgrades going and a robo. He also has a ton of workers. If this push doesn't do severe damage, you look, he's almost double my workers, I'm going to die. But this is what makes Steps of War so strong. If we look at his, let's just back it up a little bit. If we just look at his vision, early game I made a quick wall off with my barracks and I made my second depot early so he couldn't get the probe in. I intentionally did that. And I did a little micro trick where as I was sieging the tank I walked down with my marines to prevent his stalker from trying to dive up the ramp and seeing anything. So he took some damage and then as he tried to escape the first tank shot fired. If the tank was sieged he would have gotten to right here, got hit by the tank and just ran away and kept the stalker. So whenever you push in StarCraft one of the most important things you can do is set up a little harassment option that's going to hit seconds before your push. This means that the player's attention will be diverted away from the push and more importantly it means that they'll be looking somewhere else and moving their army into the incorrect position. Because this is such a small map, his observer just finished. And, or his how bad is his macro? Let's see, when did the observer actually finish? Just now. It just now came out. He doesn't have the money. He's trying to get units out here. So the reason that I rewound it is just to show that because it's a shorter rush distance map, that means that normally like, oh, the observer gets out, it's going to be able to poke around a little bit. But because, let's just say, okay, oh, it's flying, it's flying, it's flying, it gets right here. 
boom. The push is already at your front door. Now this is really sort of what the video is revolving around is showing off the importance of rush distance and the fact that if this if I was doing this rush on like a daybreak or ultra zoom stronghold or some other big ass map that would mean that the other player would have a much easier time scouting it and the attack would take quicker to get to his base and really it would be harder to catch him off guard. This is a great example of why you should choose your build orders based on map and not just do the same build every time. This is just a very simple 1-1-1 one, 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 and I played safe, I got plus one in a turret, got three tanks, this would have kept me safe from any sort of rush play early on. I opted for a banshee play because like I was saying earlier, the best thing you can do, set up a little harassment option and the Banshee is going to enter the main and look at this, the Observer comes back, let's look at Joker's vision. Is under assault. Notice how he pulled, he just panicked, pulled his whole army back and warped in a stalker at his main. Now, this allows me to set up my siege tanks in a wonderful location. You have left your probes undefended. And with this little push, you want to bring a couple SCVs and just start making maybe a turret, maybe a bunker. If you had gone Stargate, it would have been a turret. And when he senses the depth shades forward, you don't want a friendly fire, so just unseat your tanks, dare him to do it, and look at this. He's sort of forced to defend his base because he's built the cyber core out here. He's tried to make a wall in, and whenever you do a tank push, tank pushes decimate wall ends. And he had no idea I was doing a tank push because I intentionally did the early wall in to prevent scouting. So notice how these things connect. It's not just like, oh, I did a one base build in one because he wasn't ready. Because the map was small and I knew the probe scout would get there early, I fast walled. That meant that I would prevent scouting information. After that, I made sure to produce er enough early marines to prevent scouting information, and I elected to get a tank. I elected to get a turret for defense, got plus one, because plus one attack really does a number with marines, it's a big deal. Especially if you're going to hit before the toss has made an armor upgrade, and a lot of people sort of prefer attack upgrades with toss versus Terran. We saw a lot of armor upgrade. They would rush to plus three armor back in the day. That's not really so popular anymore. So I wanted to think of a build here and this one's very easy to execute and copy. Essentially I was trying to come up with a build that checked off a lot of the boxes. Was it safe in the early game against ground attacks? Was it safe in the early game against DT? Was it safe in the early game against Stargate openers? I checked off all three of those boxes. Now, I knew that if the guy went for a fast expansion, he would get really ahead economically. However, this build counters fast expansion in the sense that if you play greedy, you're not going to have the units to hold off all this stuff at this close of a rush distance. So all these things intertwine. As well as dropping the EZ on a player that says you're shit and the only reason they lost was because of an ally. Now naturally this guy said that the game was luck and you know he called me a uh, homophobic slur and accused me of only winning because I could rush. So I wanted to style on this guy and pick a different race. I wanted to prove that I could beat him in 1v1, 2v2 and with multiple races. So I'm playing my Zerg and this guy's really mad. And I know he just pretty much quit last game, but he was messaging, yeah, he was really, really mad and PMing me a lot of ridiculous things. So this is a common tactic you can do, is just act like a moron. And if someone's really salty, if, if they're not just talking shit, but if they're actually really angry, just act like a moron and act like you don't understand what they're saying. Great strategy. So this is Metalopolis. This was the first map that I ever saw a StarCraft 2 game on. Husky Starcraft Cats vs. Moro TVZ on Metalopolis for anyone wondering. And on Metalopolis, the natural is very wide open. Look how wide open this is. And we can see here, I'm pretty confident I can smoke this guy because at this point, I've noticed he's pretty much all talk and no talent. And I'm pointing out here, I really hadn't played that much StarCraft recently at all. And this was, that 2v2 that we played was like the second game that I had played in weeks. And then he started talking shit and wanted to 1v1. And then he said, Sam, I looked at his match history and it wasn't true. He had been playing 1v1. And then, weirdly, in sort of like a Combat X fashion here, he says. <laughs> one, like, like almost like a, is in control pointed out. 
like a barking chihuahua, just like, 1v1, you're fucking trash, 1v1. But I love combat, though. Although combat and the controls rivalry is one of my favorite things in StarCraft. Alright, back to the game. So we're going for Speedling Expand here, and I actually make a small mistake and keep mining gas. I was kind of contemplating a Bane Bust here, but I decided against it. I thought that expanding would be the better option. So last game we spoke about rush distances. Now as Zerg, usually rush distances don't favor you. It's harder to play on maps with short rush distances because of that long-winded explanation I gave earlier about having to choose between drones or attacking units. So I'm going to have to pause right here and just say that in general on rushing maps, you're better off just playing a way safer style, expanding later, getting a couple more unit producing facilities early, and just playing safe in general. So now we're officially moving on to Metalopolis. Now although the rush distance on this map is way longer, it is worth noting that the natural expansion is pretty open. Now, short maps sort of aren't very good for Zerg, but maps with big natural open expansions are good for Zerg. On modern maps, you often see a ramp about this big leading off to the natural. If this was a, uh, a modern map, this whole area would be like its own little plateau, and then there would be like another ramp this big coming out. The point is, is you don't have real open naturals like this anymore. Back, you know, if you're a Protoss player and you're kind of looking at this thinking, like, how the hell do I hold this? Well, back in the day, we saw players would open, like, Pylon, Forge, and sort of make a cannon wall with three buildings. That was the thing. Whenever you have huge, huge open naturals, Protoss players, the thing that you want to do is sort of say, okay, I'm not going to be able to wall off, like, this whole thing in the early game. So I want to make a wall, like you would usually like kill this with a cannon at some point too, by the way. But you want to sort of build walls that go from the base of your ramp, connecting to one side of your nexus, so you have like a half wall. And then a lot of players will park units behind here, maybe build a cannon here behind the wall in, and then keep expanding your wall up again. Think of it in the same way that you, can, you used to be able to push Zerg thirds with sentry attacks, and use their hatchery as a space to create force field walls and cut their army in half, like force field, force field, force field, and that one's a, a field or two space, and suddenly all of that's intraversible. So you want to do the same thing with your wall. Now this is the last thing you want to do, is go for quick double gas. Clearly he's trying to do like a very fast tech and play very greedy. So no zealot here yet, he just boots it up, but He's hit the ship for brain supply block. And this is an example of how if your macro gets a little bit sloppy, it can really devastate you. So we're just going to do a control F follow command. We're going to pull up the income tab. And this is an example of how if you're just a little bit sloppy with your macro in the early game, if you miss an early overlord, if you screw up a depot, if you screw up a pylon, it can set you behind a lot. Because this guy, I think, was hoping, okay, I'm just not going to make a zealot in the early game. I'm going to wait until my natural's done. And after that, I'm going to probably make... Now, you'll see in this game, he likes to go for two Stargate. And it's funny how so many people that play Protoss in 2v2 go for Stargate play. So it didn't really surprise me that that's what he tried to break out. You know, it's one thing to go for one Stargate. It's sort of like a respectable macro play. But this is, this is trying to go for like two Stargate hidden void raid nonsense. So he's one of those sort of abusive players. Now we can see that I still have less workers than him, but I've had more income for the last three minutes. Because I took my drones off gas, I had them back on now, but I took them off gas. I'm building a Roach Warren. That meant that I was able to get my natural up. And here, whenever you get Lings in your Protoss opponent's base, especially if they're going to be deli like this guy, what he should have done is just cancelled the Zealot, but I think that he thought the supply block was going to clear way, way sooner than it was. <laughs> so the Zealot ended up happening, so that was a little late, and now the Stalker's out. So at this point, the Ling nonsense has kind of ended, but we can see for like the past two minutes, I was just absolutely obnoxious. Now, notice that I forced his hand by attacking this pylon, because if this pylon goes down, the game's over and he gets supply blocked and ruined, he can't build anything. 
So we need to watch from his vision to see what this looks like. Because if we look, watch from my point of view, it just looks like he's an absolute retard and I'm stomping him. Now he is obnoxious and he's not very good, I won't deny you that. But from his perspective, it really looks like this guy might try to rush out 50 wings. And he's a moron. So did he, did he like wall himself in? Is that what really what happened? Did he wall it? How do, you, how do you manage that? You wall yourself in with the stalker. But see, he doesn't have any vision out on the map. He hasn't been able to take either tower. He hasn't really proxied into pylons. For all he knows, I could be all in and searching 50 wings. Now, I didn't actually notice this, but he actually walled himself in. That's fucking hilarious. This guy's so bad. All right, well, he's going for two star, and this is what he should have done earlier, is built the forge. And at this point, wow, I'm like, <laughs> I'm laughing at the fact this guy was so insanely bad manner and hateful and was this bad. I didn't even notice this initially. We can see here he wants to get cannons up and get a forge up. Now what he should have done is just killed this. Killed this base. So what am I doing? Do I have vision of his main? I don't. But I see a phoenix. Okay. This sort of sucks because I wanted to make a few roaches and pressure him that way. But players like this, even if they open Phoenix, they're going to be going Void Rays very soon. I can't get over this freaking wall now. <coughs> so he's starting to clear out Overlords here, which is annoying. And I sack another Overlord in his base, because if it's close, it's probably going to get found anyway. Sure enough, it's two star. And here I'm going to pressure with roaches, be a little annoying. What I don't want him to do is fly across the map. A little bit scared of that. You always want to build a spore in the path between your natural and your main. What I should have done is one creep tumor, spore right here to protect transferring drones. Because as it stands, I sort of need like another, sp I just need another spore. Especially on a big map like Metalopolis where there's all this blank plateau. So here he's hidden a base and I see it as I'm pulling an overlord back. Thankfully I have saved a few roaches after making all of his probes transfer. And this guy, he's lost so much money in the early game having to run around and retreat his workers. and He's not in a good spot and he's one of these players who likes to go for mass air. So it's sort of funny because these guys will pretty much go for exclusively air units and cannons. So I don't even know how much half walling himself in hurt. Obviously the the one stalker could have saved, but like it was just two links, you know. Hydra's coming out just in time and these should have been completely stutter step like look at that. That's pretty bad micro micro. I should have been consistently stutter stepping those forward. And between these games I sort of said something along the lines of because his name's Joker, I said. So is the joke that you run your mouth and then lose in games like that? And he called me some more homophobic slurs. And Hydra's are going to be the choice for me. I've already gotten Hydra speed. Zerg players, you should always be getting Hydra speed first and range second. Taking my third, I want to get a spore up over there at my third. And at this point, whenever you're facing off against Aerostyles, you really want mass Hydra. Thankfully, I have like four roaches. So if he had actually made some gates and gone for more of, I don't know, a little more ground army, you always want to have a couple roaches in the front to tank if possible. Like, e like e even if there were three ground units here, it would be nice to have a couple roaches mixed in. It's just way harder to deal with than pure Hydra. But obviously against two star, you got to focus on Hydras. Notice here that, well, they evaporate, so you can't, there we go. You can't, couldn't really notice, but you got to focus fire the voids because the voids are the money. And I start to, I say funny joke and he leaves. So in general, if the map is open, really open, and it's hard for Toss to expand, you can go for a speedling expand and pressure them. And I don't expect to do damage like this because not everyone you're playing will talk this much and be this bad. But this is a nice little lesson and if the map is open, you can sort of play it this way. If the map is small, you need to play it this way. Obviously, these weren't the highest level games. This is just some bozo that challenged me to a 1v1. But I think it was a nice little learning tool nonetheless. Also, if someone 
likes to go for these two stargate styles and they play the other cut you're coming from a 2v2 game check for hidden bases that's how these people like to play i could have very easily lost this game had i maybe taken a couple bad engagements made late spores made a late hydra den and not scouted this base if this base gets up and it starts mining i can take a couple bad fights and lose to void rays idra actually lost one of his gsl games and got knocked out of the gsl because a Protoss player, it was the same positions, Zerg right here, Toss right here, but the Toss player hit a base right here super early and like mined from it the whole game. And very close, like it, very frequently Idra would push, almost kill him, get pushed back. And you know, he'd be thinking like, oh, he's only on two bases, I'll just make more. Make more, push, didn't kill him, get pushed back. Okay, now Colossus are out. And it just got worse and worse until he ended up losing and it was really sad. Subscribe for more.